Audio good? Yeah, cool, awesome. All right, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Sam Berklin. I'm a scientific software developer. I work with Julia a lot. I wanted to give a talk today uh, that I called Understanding Your Struct Toolbox. This is sort of an introduction to things that I thought would have been really helpful to know uh, just sort of working with structs uh, when I was first starting out. Um, and just for reference, the QR code does link to the slides, which are also available uh, at that uh, GitHub link on the title there. So I think when I was starting out, it's very easy to that we sort of think about structs are just sort of fancy named tuples because we're able to stuff data into these sort of like named containers and access data within these containers using the dot syntax. Um, moving forward, you sort of start to understand that structs are a lot more fundamental to the language. Uh, obviously, they're sort of the core of dispatch within Julia. They're how we get access to a lot of mutation in different objects without calling into particular C code. And if you're building something like a framework for other people to solve problems using your abstractions, those abstractions usually take the representation of like different kinds of structs. So they sort of specify the language in which you solve your problem. So if you're working with a lot of Julia code, I think it's important uh, that you're writing structs and that you understand sort of the basic, like, nice to have things whenever you're uh, working with structs. So the first thing I wanna go over is like how we think about struct equality. So if we define this like very simple struct on the left-hand side planet where it has uh, some like string name inside of it and then a vector of places uh, inside of it as well and we make two different instances of this, uh, one named Jupiter with a place called Red Dot, and then another instance with the same name and the same place inside of it, and we try to assert that these are equal. Uh, the default implementation of equality will say that these are not equal structs because of the way, the fallback for how we do uh, equality between structs. So what we need to do is we need to do sort of a manual implementation of equality where we do this sort of field-wise equality and then we add all of these together uh, is sort of the typical notion of equality that we're looking for. Um, and then if we do this, you can see on the right-hand side, we try to do this assertion again, and we see that these two different like, instances of this struct are equal. And worth pulling out, pointing out, anytime that you define a custom implementation of equality, uh, it's recommended that you also implement a custom implementation of hashing as well. So the notion of equality that we want is usually like, pretty standard. We want to do this sort of field-wise equality. So there is a very nice package called autohashequals.jl, which will do this for you. Um, and all you have to do is you prepend this like at autohashequals macro behind your struct definition, and you'll get sort of these nice standard notions of equality and hashing implemented for your types. The next thing uh, that we like to talk about is iteration over structs. So iteration uh, is an interface within Julia. It's how we get this sort of like four X in Y syntax to work in Julia. In order to just get that to work, there's one method that you have to implement. It's this base.iterate. Uh, iterate takes two functions. Optionally, the, the second one's sort of optional. First one is uh, what is the object that you're trying to iterate over, and the second one is the state. The state tends to be what is, uh, for something that's already collected, it's like what is the index that you're trying to to, to, to iterate over. Uh, and so when you iterate, what you do is you return, here's the current object uh, from this step of iteration, and here's sort of the next state to compute what is the next object that I return. And so you iterate over the object this way, and whenever you're done iterating, you return sort of a sentinel value, nothing, to indicate that you were done iterating. And so if you do this, you get on the right-hand side, you just get the four X in Y sort of syntax just works automatically. And so this is, uh, I think, one of the first things people will encounter as an interface that allows you to stop working with leaky abstractions. If you're able to iterate directly over objects that are containers over other like containers of objects, uh, you no longer have to think about how are things stored inside of the struct that I'm working with because you can do things like iterate over it directly. Uh, and this helps people not have to dig into the details of how things are implemented and work more directly with the abstractions that you intend them to work with. Also, on the right-hand side, uh, if you implement just like that one iterate method from the last, last slide, you can do things like zip together two iterators and iterate over them in, in tandem. So there's a whole host of things that you get out if you just implement this like one method uh, that you don't get if you have to sort of, you know, manually reach in and try to pull out things that you want to iterate over. And just a quick side note on this as like an interface, I gave a talk on the idea of interfaces within Julia last year, and that is available at this link uh, on the slide as well. 
So there was a talk yesterday about Julia's uh, superpower kind of being the existence of this REPL, which is really nice for doing sort of interactive REPL-driven development. And I think in doing this sort of interactive REPL-driven development, it's nice to be able to inspect types in a way that's meaningful to the user in addition to something that's meaningful to the, to the computer. So by default, when you show something in the REPL, it just prints a string that's meant to be able to be copy and pasted into the REPL to like build a new, a new instance of that same struct, which is very nice if you want to be able to copy and paste uh, that string and build the same instance of that struct. But in practice, you know, if we're working interactively, maybe we care a little bit more about other parts of the, of the struct or other statistics. So if you want to pretty print uh, your struct, you have to implement this sort of three argument show. The first argument to show is this sort of IO abstract type, which is a container with a bunch of different information about like the, where you're trying to display uh, whatever it is that you're trying to show. Uh, the second argument is this MIME type, and if you're trying to implement sort of this REPL pretty printing for your struct, you need to do the text plane MIME type. Then the last thing is of course like the struct that you're trying to, to pretty print to the REPL. And so what we do here uh, inside of the show method is you sort of build a string of how you would like to, to print, or to render your, uh, your struct into the REPL. And here, uh, what I do is I sort of prepend what the name is of the individual field within the struct before I print the value of, the, the value of that field, which is a little nicer if we're trying to not have to keep track of what are the order of arguments whenever I'm trying to, to build the struct. So here we can print planet one and you see that the name is Earth and here's the list of places, rather than having to remember that the first argument is going to be the name and the second argument is going to be the list of places. And likewise, uh, with all of these show methods and with that sort of IO context that gets passed in, uh, there are sort of conventions on things about like, am I printing this in an array? Should I truncate? Uh, how, how much should I truncate the, the types that I'm printing? Which gets you the uh, like nice array printing there in the bottom right. This is very nice for interactive development, which lets you print sort of like summary statistics if uh, like simulation results and things like that. So the final thing I wanted to talk about is the concept of finalizers. So here, uh, this is a mutable struct where both fields are marked as const. And then we register this finalizer uh, called say goodbye in the inner constructor. So whenever we exit Julia or whenever that an instance of this struct is garbage collected, it will call, actually call that code, uh, say goodbye, and it'll like print this nice message saying goodbye uh, whenever you know, that code is, no, or whenever that struct is no longer held in memory. So this is something that we're able to do with mutable structs, we're not able to do it with immutable structs, and it doesn't actually rely on mutation. So the important part about mutable structs is the identity, not the fact that they possess mutation. And this is very useful for things like C, FFI, if you need to clean up memory, uh, managed by other programming languages. So that's all I had to talk about. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, if you have any questions, we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. There's one question. Are there any uh, tools you could recommend if you're creating your own custom structs to sort of validate that you've done all of the housekeeping that you need to around things like equality and hashing and whatnot? Sure, uh, so I don't have something to recommend offhand. This sort of leads into the idea of interfaces uh, that I was talking about last year. If you wanted to say that all of the structs that I implement are going to implement a custom show method, all of them are going to implement it, their own like hashing and equality, uh, you could write uh, sort of like manual test cases to just like inspect the method table to see that those exist. I don't know of something off the top of my head, but using one of the various interface packages, like required interfaces, I think, is one of them. Uh, you should be able to specify what that interface is and automate that checking. Go here. 
if you want, if it's easier.